that uh, opening music there. Uh, welcome to Shoalhaven Baptist Church, everybody. Uh, those in the room and those live streaming, it's good to have uh, Brother Fred Dawson visiting with us and Mike, and we've got uh, Pastor Skelton here and a number of uh, regulars. And we're looking forward to hearing from evangelist Chris Hustler in just a little bit. But let's uh, sing song number seven right after we, we open in prayer. Song number seven in the Majesty hymnal is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's a prayerful song. We, we sing that to the Lord because uh, he is the fount. Uh, the Lord's Holy Spirit spoke to us last night, and we're asking that uh, he would speak to us again this evening from the preaching, from his word. But uh, let's, let's open in prayer then. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, to meet like this in your house with your people, to hear uh, your man preach your word. Lord, we're thankful for the freedoms that we have in Australia. We're thankful how you've touched our hearts, Lord, and for every one of us that are listening now who know you as Savior, we're, we're thankful uh, beyond what our lips can, can say uh, for salvation from sin and hell. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to those who are listening this evening who may not be saved. Help them to understand that it's a not, a matter, not a matter of works. It's a matter of trusting uh, by faith in your mercy, your grace, and your death, burial, and resurrection uh, for them. Lord, to save from sin and hell. And then every person, Lord, who is saved, I pray that you would uh, you'd speak to our hearts from your word and help us to, to see something we can change, something we uh, need to do differently, something we need to keep doing, maybe something we need to stop, and help us to be obedient uh, to you, to your will. Lord, we pray that missions would be advanced. It's our missions month. We pray that you'd be with those who are on their way uh, to the service right now. Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with sickness, those who are dealing uh, with uh, uh, flood consequences. Lord, we, we pray that you'd uh, just be with uh, people, especially your people, Lord, uh, as they deal with the, the situation around them. And again, may we learn something tonight about how to deal uh, the right way, the way you would want us to deal with, with uh, life's difficulties, life's problems. And Lord, may we learn to do so with a, a good spirit, a good attitude, and a, a thankful heart. Please bless the service tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, go to song number seven. Come thou fount of every blessing. those some good good words well uh, we're gonna go just uh, one song back one page back to song number five but let me make a couple of announcements first uh, this is the second night of our uh, evangelistic meetings with uh, evangelist Chris Hustler and you'll meet him if you haven't met him before you meet him in a few moments he spoke last night and uh, let's see, uh, he's going to be speaking tomorrow with uh, our kids club and our youth. And that's at 4.30 and 6 o'clock. 
And then Saturday morning, we'll have a men's breakfast here at 8 a.m. And uh, he'll be the spiritual food after we have the, uh, the physical food. Then Saturday night at 7 p.m., he'll be speaking to us. Then Sunday morning, we've got our regular service, 10 o'clock uh, and 11 o'clock uh, Sunday school and, and the main worship service. He'll be speaking in both of those. And then we have a luncheon and a book launch. Amen. So looking forward to all of that. And let me just give you a quick reminder, a couple things. This is our missions month here at Soul Haven Baptist Church. Uh, we've had some special speakers. We'll have some uh, for the remainder of the month, and we'll be uh, talking more about uh, faith promise. Pastor Shellebear uh, will, and uh, then we'll be collecting uh, faith promise uh, cards at the end of the month or shortly after the, the end of the month. So all month is the missions month here. And then we mentioned that there would be some baptisms. I think we might have given a date of April 3, but we're going to extend that a little bit further to April 17. Was that? That was, yep. So April 17, we're planning on having uh, some baptisms. Got a, a one or two lined up right now, a couple others that are in need of baptism. So if uh, you'd like to uh, do so, please uh, let me know or, or just go straight to Pastor Shellebear, and he'll schedule a, a brief meeting with you and go over a few things for that. Okay, let's sing hymn number five, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. <coughs> Yes, uh, if you're wondering who we're singing about, we're singing about the Lord Jesus. And now we're going to stand together and sing song number 12. And right after this song, this is all hail the power of Jesus' name. Right after this, Pastor Shellebear is going to come. He's going to introduce uh, evangelist Chris Hustler. But let's all be upstanding and sing song number 12. <coughs>
Amen. Yes, thank you for that. All right, Pastor Shellebear, please come at this time. Thank you, musicians. Thank you. Good singing. Thank you, Pastor Hall. Wonderful way to start a church service at any time. And here we are on Thursday evening, singing Crown Him Lord of All. What a wonderful way to get started. Thank you, Pastor Hall. Great song leading. Thank you. And um, I would like to introduce uh, uh, evangelist Chris Hustler. So I will. And uh, I've known uh, Brother Hustler, I don't know, perhaps 30 years. It's quite a while. And um, we've been good friends for a long time. And he has always been a preacher of the gospel. A wonderful exponent of God's word and I'm sure tonight that uh, he will delight your soul with preaching from his word uh, from God's word that is and so uh, he's been a good friend to our church and comes occasionally uh, to uh, preach to us in special meetings and this is one of those special occasions so brother Hustler won't you come and uh, bring to us something from God's word this, this evening Thank you, Pastor Shillaby. Good evening, everybody. My apologies for the crocus still. For some reason, it persisteth. <clears throat> but that's neither here nor there. Can you hear me back there? Well, I'll have to talk softer. All right. Acts and chapter 17, if you'd open your Bible there this evening, please. We are... Uh, we have a bit of a theme concerning what's after COVID. And uh, when we first started uh, talking about coming for these meetings and Pastor Shellebear suggested that, uh, in my pea brain, I was uh, angling around on why COVID? Why are we going through this time of uh, difficulty, this pandemic that seems to have swept the world? And it's not finished yet, but that's probably because God's not finished yet and uh, there are lessons to be learned. But this is a good time for us to examine our own personal walk with the Lord, our own personal relationship with the Lord and uh, very thankful for the opportunity to uh, share from the Word of God with you tonight. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we, as we open the Word together let's pray heavenly father we ask your blessing upon your word as it is opened as it's read as it's heard as it's spoken you've promised that the entrance of thy words give a flight yea you've declared that the purpose of the son of god coming into this world was that the people that sat in darkness might see a great light and he is and ever will be the light of the world and he is able to lighten our darkness and to still this day set prisoners free from the bondage and the shackles of sin, uplift the downcast, the fallen, encourage and strengthen the frail. He is able to strengthen the weakened hands that we might employ ourselves in the labour and the purpose of the King to reach others with the wonderful message of Christ crucified risen and coming again soon coming whether men and women are ready or not he is coming again he's coming to judge he's coming to reckon with the faithless he's coming to reward the righteous he's coming to receive his own and he's coming to rule and to reign now father as we seek to exalt christ tonight as we look into the word, be pleased to bless our time. We pray and ask in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. <clears throat> i just get my little cheaters on here. Having a bit of trouble last night, I had the wrong glasses on. <laughs> and uh, That really didn't help very much at all. Right? But tonight I can actually see something tonight, so that's a, that's a good start. And I haven't got a mask on, so the glasses aren't going to fog up. <laughs> uh, all right, now chapter 17. Strangely enough, being a high school dropout, I have long since learned that chapter 17 follows chapter 16. 
Now, if that's a shock to you, you probably went to school with me. But, um, but uh, chapter 16 ended on a high note with uh, Paul and Silas having been beaten and thrust in the prison and God intervening and bringing about the testimony of salvation for the Philippian jailer and then a witness uh, to all the city and to the rulers of the city and then being sent on their way. And chapter 17 begins on this wise when it says now, excuse me, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring him out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, saying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Isn't that a wonderful testimony for these faithful servants of God that they are turning the world upside down? They said, Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night under Berea, whom coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. We need to understand something of the history that takes place here. That the city of Thessalonica, uh, where there are supposedly these hot mineral pools, I guess today they'd be renowned for being a spa, uh, a health clinic of some sort, was named the city of Therma under the rule of the Greeks during the reign of the Greek Empire the city was renamed Thessaloniki and Thessaloniki was the sister of Alexander the Great and so this uh, outside of Rome and outside of that time Constantinople was considered to be the richest and most prosperous city the most popular city in all of uh, the empire and so when Paul comes to this city, we're told that there is a synagogue there. When he went to Philippi, there's no mention of the synagogue. And Paul resorts down by the riverside and uh, finds people there gathered together. And there he ministers. What has happened here, though, and uh, it's, it's very important to understand this from this passage, is that during the days of the Roman Empire, some 215 years after the Greeks have moved off the scene that Rome is clutching to power brutally Rome does not countenance any any uh, resistance anyone bucking against the system and uh, there was a great rebellion taking place in the east from Rome and uh, they were sending out their armies their forces by land and by sea and brutally putting down ruthlessly putting down any uh, resistance, any rebellion. And uh, of course, we know that historically from the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, uh, historians tell us that the hills for miles and miles around Jerusalem during the siege of 70 AD to the fall of Jerusalem, the hills around were bare of trees because the Roman soldiers had cut down every possible piece of timber to build their uh, their battle siege, but also to crucify people. There wasn't a tree available where somebody had not shed their blood and had their life taken. And so these people, during this one of these great rebellions, the city of Thessalonica had actually sided with Rome. People fleeing there to try and find refuge were refused. Uh, those who were among leadership of some of the rebels were exposed and handed over to the authorities. The result of with this was their loyalty to the Rome, to the Emperor of Rome. 
led to this city being declared a free city. Now this simply means that uh, to you and I, here's a city where nobody ever pays tax. There are numbers of occasions where taxes and custom are received and spoken of in the Bible, but not in Thessalonica, not as a free city. And of course, you can understand being a very large and very prosperous city, uh, this would be very popular. It must have been very popular because years later, the Apostle Paul lamented that one of his fellow laborers, Demas, hath forsaken me and has departed under Thessalonica. Demas must have seen something of the prosperity and the wealth in Thessalonica and some years later he couldn't shake it. Some years later it still got a hold on his heart and he wouldn't be the first one, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, who fall into the category of they that will be rich fall into perdition and snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And so the background, the history of the, uh, the city here. And uh, then we have the arrival of the Apostle Paul and we're told of his habit. His habit is that wherever there is a synagogue, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Pretty simple. That Paul tells us in Romans, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal, but not, a zeal for righteousness, but not according to knowledge. For they going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. And so Paul understood, having had legal righteousness, having had his self-righteousness, and having seen the righteousness of God that was freely given to all those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friend tonight, that includes you. You have your self-righteousness. Your self-righteousness is what you think of you. It's not a matter of what other people think of you. It is what you think of you, what me thinks of me. There are people, this town's probably filled with people who have what they, uh, they understand to be legal righteousness. That if I, if I keep the golden rule, if I do unto others as I would have them do unto me, forgetting that that's not the golden rule. The golden rule begins with thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, then you deal with the neighbour. But uh, we live in a culture today where we are uh, pagan. We're a pagan, pagan nation. We are, uh, we're under the influence of affluence. We are steeped in a myriad of idols, from our work to our pleasures to our sports to our drugs and our alcohol our work and just about anything else you want to rattle off, even our families can become an idol before God. And so when Paul comes to this city, as his manner was, he goes into the synagogue and for three Sabbath days seizes the opportunity to preach the gospel. And we are blessed that we are given a very simple outline of his preaching, opening and alleging. So he begins with telling them, who is Christ? What does the scripture, what would the scripture tell us of this man, Jesus Christ? Well, we look into the scripture and, uh, and you know, that which the Spirit of God would reveal to this man. They knew the time of the birth of Christ. They knew the place of the birth of Christ. They knew all the history of the birth of Christ. They knew that he was a fulfillment of one of the very first prophecies in the book of Genesis in chapter 3, at the fall of man into sin, God had promised that the seed of the woman, not the seed of man, the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. God had promised that he would send a saviour to deliver us from the bondage of sin. And ultimately, not only the bondage of sin, but from the penalty of sin, and one day from the very presence of sin. And God kept his word in that he sent his son, the scripture says, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation has to do with satisfying justice, the payment of a debt that satisfies justice. Imagine if I was on trial here tonight and the judge found me guilty and uh, sentenced me to a fine of a uh, million dollars. I ain't got a million dollars. I wouldn't know what a million dollars looks like. Maybe you could show me a picture of it. Maybe you've got it in your wallet. You're a, 
educated man, Brother Ram. He, he's got a million dollars hanging around. All of, it. all of it. All right. So Brother Ram's got a million dollars, and I say, well, you know, look, you, you, you're on a judge, you know, I can't pay. And they say, well, you know, take him away, lock him up, throw away the key, let him rot. And so that is the sentence. And then Brother Ram, who was a wealthy man, steps up and says, I'll pay the debt. I'll pay his fee. I'll pay his fine. I'll pay the penalty. You and I need to understand that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ paid a debt he did know because we had a debt we could never pay. The scripture says, For as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. When you and I trust Jesus Christ as our Saviour, God gives to us as a gift His righteousness. You see on the wall here, it talks about being born again. It talks about regeneration. This is the work of the Spirit of God when we have been convicted of our sin and we have turned to God in faith, believing that Jesus Christ died in our stead, that He took our place when He died on the cross, that, that God made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. In fact, Paul would tell us in Romans chapter 4 that He was delivered for our offences and raised again for our justification, therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine Paul preaching this? Preaching that Jesus Christ was the prophesied one there of the virgin that was revealed in the book of Isaiah and the birthplace of Bethlehem. Isn't it amazing that when Christ was born, we're told the wise men came from the east, came to the castle of, of King Herod and said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. This must drive the politically correct bonkers because they came looking for a man. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? They're looking for a monarch. and They're looking for a Messiah. Herod didn't know. They gathered all the religious rulers together and said, where will the Christ be born? I mean, these men have just arrived. He's been born. He's come. He's arrived. He's been born. You know, we've seen his star. We're on our way. Where is he? And they opened up the book of Micah and said, oh, it says here in Bethlehem. Well, off they went, lickety, split down the road and found him. What did the rest of the religious hoi polloi do? Well, I guess they scratched their phylactery and went home back to counting their little beads or whatever it was and, and just went about their business as if nothing had happened. But isn't that exactly what the scripture tells us, that he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not? He's the creator. He's the one who upholds all things by the very word of his power. He's the sustainer. He's the mediator. He's the saviour. In the world, the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own. He came into his own, his own people and his own received him not. But praise God, regeneration, born again, salvation. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I can envisage Paul preaching this very clearly. I can see Paul, uh, he's got three Sabbath days. And every Sabbath day, maybe some of them said, oh, not again. Not this bloke. I mean, this is a guy who put a fellow to sleep with his long preaching. You ever read that passage in Acts? It says, when Paul was long in preaching. I heard a good message one time, can't remember who it was, said, how long should a sermon be? He said, it's got to reach all the way back to eternity past to reveal the greatness of the King of glory of God. And it's going to reach all the way out into eternity for the children of God and the heavenly hope that we have that never fades away. And it's got to reach down to the very depths of hell to save men and rescue them from the burning. It's got to reach up to the heights of heaven where the King of glory rules and reigns. So how long should a sermon be? We should tell you to strap in. We might go a while tonight. No, we won't. It's Thursday night, I know you've had a long day, so that's all right. <clears throat> I might cark it before then anyway. But he says that this same Jesus must needs have suffered. Can you imagine him going through, uh, perhaps even having been an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ? You see, Paul, Paul was, a, was the prize student of a man named Gamaliel. We find Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. 
Gamaliel has become the master of Israel. Who was the master of Israel before Gamaliel, you might ask, or you didn't ask, but I'll tell you anyway. He was a man by the name of Nicodemus. Strangely enough, Nicodemus on three occasions in John's Gospel is moving closer and closer and at the crucifixion and the burial of Christ, he comes out as one who was fully persuaded that this was the Son of God. And then are we surprised that we never hear from Nicodemus ever again? Shamed and ostracized and put out of the Jewish hierarchy and out of the Jewish community? And so Gamaliel comes and he's the one to whom they will bring uh, all their difficulties. And at his feet sits a young man named Saul of Tarsus. Is it possible Saul of Tarsus was there with all the other uh, religious rabble screaming and baying for blood on the day in which Christ was crucified? Was he there? Did he see him hanging on the cross? I mean, this man, Paul, has been absolutely rabid for the law. Not for the law of the Lord, but for the law of the land, for the law of the Jewish people, for their understanding of the Jewish law. I often have to explain this to people, that the Torah, the law of God, God's law, uh, takes us some 300 pages if you were to sit down and write it out. 300 pages. In the time of Christ, the Torah has been virtually consiled to the two hard basket, and what we have now is the Talmud, which is a collection of books and scrolls and writings and all these other bits and pieces that the Jewish people have put together over the preceding thousand odd years. You look at the law of God. Commandment number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take of his name in vain. In the Torah it occupies one and a half lines. One and a half lines in the Hebrew language, writing from the wrong side of the page. In the Talmud, it occupies seven volumes. Seven volumes where you could find all kinds of excuses and reasons why you could profane God's name and not be held guilty. That's the sham. That's what Jesus said, uh, he referred to as your tradition, making the word of God of none effect, he said, through your tradition. And so here's Paul not preaching tradition, preaching the word of God, preaching the suffering Christ. I wonder if he opened the scriptures and read Psalm 22 to them, that he was poured out like wax, that they compassed him about, strong bulls of Bashan gaping on him with their mouths could he rehearse for them himself having perhaps been an eyewitness the scene when Christ was crucified and then that glorious testimony of his resurrection from the dead and he says that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ it's interesting the writer of the gospel of the book of Acts is a man by the name of Luke he's a he is a physician He's a very learned man. I find it interesting that Luke uses in this, in this uh, passage of scripture the same phrase he used for the feeding of the 5,000 which he said referred to 5,000 men. Not the women and children, just 5,000 men. Is it possible that they saw literally thousands turned to Christ in Thessalonica? I mean, we're talking about a very, very, very large city a very prosperous city and it would seem a very religious city. Now I'm thankful the Lord Jesus Christ got me before any religion did. I'm glad for that. But you know I've had friends down through my life who have been bound and gagged by religion, mauled and, and just bruised and broken by religion. I have several members of my family who are good Catholics. And by good Catholic, I mean they go to church at Easter and Christmas, and that's a good Catholic. They turn up at funerals when there's a funeral, but you know, like me, before I was saved, I only went to weddings and funerals for the free feed and the free drink. But uh, don't do that no more. Don't get invited anymore. Probably because my wife doesn't behave herself. Anyway. <laughs> I hope you're not watching, dear. That was a joke. <laughs> but it says here, 
and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Of the Greeks, of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. These are people who are genuinely seeking, but they're seeking in religion. They're seeking in becoming proselytes and becoming Jews. They're seeking through ritual of circumcision. They're seeking through putting themselves under the, uh, under the so-called laws of the Jew. And these Jews were very demanding, very ruthless, very cruel. And is it any wonder that it is of the Jews, that it is of the Jews that they are moved with envy. They're not happy with Paul's preaching. They're not happy with this. Now another interesting point here before we move on is this. When they finally bring about their, their ruckus comes to the rulers, Notice the charges they made. They said that these all do uh, according, saying that there is another king. Treason. They enjoy this tax-free haven because of their loyalty to Rome. If this was to get out that people in this city are now worshipping another king, now, Rome was pretty, pretty straightforward. You worship the emperor or you get fed to the lions or the bears or whatever it is. Or we, uh, or we, you know, many Christians were executed by means of what they referred to as a Roman candle. People tied around the walls of the city. People suspended from archways, large gateways, dipped in coal tar and bound up. And as the sun set, they'd set them alight. And that's how they execute them. That's where we got the old phrase, the Roman candle. That might be why we're not allowed to have crackers anymore in Australia. Somebody was offended by it. But it says here, another king. And when they, when the, and this troubled, they troubled the people and the rulers when they heard these things. It didn't seem to trouble them that Jesus was claimed to be the Messiah. It didn't seem to trouble them that he had been crucified and buried and rose again from the dead and therein is the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and then he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What bothered them is that we're going to lose all our goodies. We're going to lose all our freebies. Rome will come down and come down hard on us and we have so much to lose here. And so we're told that the end result was that they took a security, in the very literal sense, a promise from Jason and of the other, and then they let them go and the brethren sent Paul away. Now come over here to 1 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul has moved on down the road and some six to eight months later, he tells us here in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 3 that he is in great uh, anguish. You see, he's only been there for three Sabbath days. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm a skilled dropout, but you can probably work this out. If they left Philippi on the Monday, it would probably take them three or four days to get from Philippi to Thessalonica. So let's say they get there on a Friday and maybe they spend eight days there before he gets the lay of the land and they know where there's a synagogue. So let's have eight days and then we have one Sabbath day. Then we have another seven days and we have two Sabbath days. Then we have another seven days and we have a third Sabbath day after which someone threw the cat among the pigeons and things got nasty. And now after three Sabbath days, and you know, the most you can probably stretch Paul's time out to is maybe 35, 36 days. That's not a long time. Brother Shells, how long have you been here in Shoalhaven in Nowra? 18 years. All right, someone will whip out a calculator and tell us 18 times 365 plus probably four and five leap years. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> we won't count how many Sundays it is. But let me ask you this. How much do you think a preacher could accomplish in three services? 
And moreover, as I look here in Thessalonians, Paul tells us that they were laboring night and day. People often forget that that five out of every eight people in the empire of Rome are literally slaves and they are illiterate. So anything they will ever know, anything they'll ever learn will come from the lips of somebody else. They won't pick something up and read it. It's always amazed me. We go to AFRI, we had a PNG and you go into the the poor places in in Mauritius and places in Zambia and Botswana and you go to hand out gospel tracts and because it's free, everybody wants one. But it's, it's, it's a real blessing when you actually find somebody who sits down on the side of the road and starts looking at it. And you go over and you have a conversation with them, say, can you read it? And they say, no. And you actually get down and sit, sit down there with them in the dirt and actually read it to them and explain it to them. Imagine these people are very dependent on what they will hear from the mouths of others. Now, what do you think they hear in the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day in the synagogue from the religious rulers, from the Jewish people? Straighten that phylactery. Tighten that girdle. Have you been circumcised? Are you ready for the Passover? Are you observing the feasts? Have you washed? Have you done the ceremonial washing of the, the hands and the feet? Uh, are you unclean in some way? Have you defiled yourself? All I mean, oh, the rules, the rules, the rules. All about the human physical body and nothing for the human heart or soul. But Paul said, we laboured night and day. Why? Well, I have no trouble envisioning people coming to see him all hours of the night and day because they've heard the preaching, they've heard the teaching, they've heard the gospel. And we've never heard anything like this before, that God should become a man and die in our stead. How is that possible? Well, it's not possible for man to become God, but for God to step down into space and time and take upon him the form of a human body. And as the scripture says, and being found in fashion as a man, humble himself and become obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Hebrews 2 tells us, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same, that through death. Spirit can't die, a body can. This physical body can die. One day you'll hear Chris Hustle is dead. Don't believe a word of it, I'll be more alive than I have ever been before. Don't you worry about that. Now, so we have the... the, the Apostle Paul pacing the floor like an expectant father. And in chapter 3, he shares with folks how he, his anguish is what's happened to the church. What's happened to all these young believers? Uh, I mean, the fire of God has literally fallen on the synagogue and the people of Thessalonica. Multitudes, multitudes have trusted Christ. And they've got three Sabbath days. Three Sabbath days of discipleship. Three Sabbath days of instruction and understanding in the Old Testament. Up until this point in time, uh, there, there is very little New Testament as yet. And they've gone. They're on their way to Berea. They're on their way to Athens. They're on their way to Rome. They're, they're, they're gone. What happens to this tender plant? But at your leisure, if you read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, he talks about how he sends Timothy and Timothy comes back and, and, and gives him this glowing report which leads to the writing of 1 Thessalonians. And listen to this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul says in verse 2, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labour of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the sight of God our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. What does that tell you? That tells you that after Paul left town, the riot wasn't really over. There were people that were still standing for Christ and paying for it. There were people who were suffering 
for the gospel's sake back in Thessalonica. But then he goes on and says, so that you become on examples of all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith to God would is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. How is that possible? When he says not only in Thessalonica but in Macedonia and Achaia, he's saying all throughout Shoalhaven, all throughout New South Wales, wherever we go, people are talking about what's happened in Thessalonica. People are getting fired up and when we seek to preach the gospel, they say, oh, hang on. Is this the message of the gospel that they're preaching in Thessalonica? Paul says, say no more. For from you sounded out the gospel and the word of the Lord sounded out so clearly so that Paul says, we have need to speak nothing. We have no need to speak anything. What a testimony. What an amazing witness. How long did it take? Can we say five weeks? February 18th, I celebrated my 43rd birthday in the Lord. Got saved the first time I heard the gospel preach. Someone once told me that statistically that makes me one in a million. My mother always thought I was one in a raffle, but, you know, I'm... Sorry. This is, this, folks, this is amazing to have such, such a radiant testimony in such a young church in such a short time. You know, I know you're a bit older now, but do you like to go window shopping? Take it easy, Mary, it's all right. <laughs> if you can hold it together, we'll all get out of here alive. <laughs> Hello, Michelle, lovely to see you. Do you, go, do you ever go window shopping? No, I don't, don't really do it. Yeah, the only time I really get moved as far as covetousness is when I see some billy goat driving down the road with a big pickup truck and two sea on the back trailer. And I'm thinking you should be taking them to my house, not to the beach or down to the river. But uh, that's about it. Yeah. yeah, when I look at this church, I'm not window shopping, but I'm drooling. I'm covetous to think myself, how do you get a church with a testimony like that? That's what God wants in every church, in every gospel preaching, Bible believing, fundamental Baptist church, whatever else you want to call it, that's what God would have as a witness for all of his churches, for all of his people everywhere. I don't know about you, but every now and again I look at the headlines and, and see pictures of these people praying in the Ukraine, praying in bombed out buildings, singing, singing praise while the bullets and the missiles and fly all around about them. It's amazing. Such a testimony of strength, such courage in the face of such, well, godless adversity. What's the secret here? Was it Paul? Did Paul somehow or other carry a bit of a Peter Pan pixie dust around his pocket and just sort of sprinkles them on the congregation and everybody suddenly gets all fired up and excited for God and it just doesn't wear off? It was at the place. One of the most wonderful things you find, sometimes in the richest places you find the people who have got the emptiest lives. And when they suddenly are confronted with the claims of Jesus Christ, it is not just soul saving, but it is life changing. Remember, years ago, I read the I read a testimony um, by a man called Stanley Telchin. Telchin was a very successful Jewish businessman in New York City. He was high up in the chair and the presidency of several exclusive clubs and all this sort of stuff. 
And then one day a man witnessed to him and he was grossly offended that this Jewish man witnessed to him about Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was just a dirty old Gentile. Jesus Christ could have no claim to be the Messiah, could not be the Christ because he's a Gentile. And this man gave him a little booklet and challenged him, said, when you go home, I challenge you, ask Jehovah to open your ears, your eyes, your heart and read Matthew chapter 1. Just read that. Just one chapter. Well, he thought, what harm could it do? I can repent afterwards and go to the synagogue and cleanse myself. And he begins reading and suddenly finds Jesus is in the line of David. Jesus is a son of Abraham. Jesus is a Jew, not a Gentile. And that triggered something for him because he began thinking, if they've lied about all this, what else have they lied about? If I've believed all my life that my parents and my grandparents told me that Jesus was a dirty old Gentile and he had no claim because he wasn't a Jew, and now I find out here that he is a Jew, what else have I got wrong? Not long after that, he got saved, trusted Jesus Christ and paid a tremendous price for it commercially, personally, socially, but not spiritually. He went from being totally bankrupt to being poor in spirit to being a child of God. Praise God. So I ask myself, is it the place? Was it the preacher? Was it something they had for dinner that day? I mean, you know, sometimes uh, you know, I've been some places where you can, you know, the food, that'll bring a crowd. Look here for a moment with me in, in chapter 2. This is the key. This is what makes the difference. Not a, it made the difference in Thessalonica. This is what will make the difference in your life and my life and in our churches. Chapter 2 and in verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because that when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They often say that attitude is 99% of the battle. And so I ask the question, what is your attitude to this book we call the Bible, which is the word of God? This book tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We are told that God has magnified his word above all of his name. Jesus in his high priestly prayer of John 17 says, Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, the problem is people come to the word of God with this buffet mentality that we're going to pick and choose what we want and just chuck the rest. But Peter says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. A telltale sign of our, the reality of our relationship with Christ, and in that our relationship with our Heavenly Father, whether he is just your God because he's the creator, or whether he is your Heavenly Father because you are his child. The difference will be found in your attitude to the Word of God, your appetite for the Word of God. Because many Christians today are totally void of any knowledge of God's Word. There are churches all around this country, all around the world, big churches. Some call them mega churches. And it's all about feeling good and having a good time and, and rock your socks off and jam for the lamb, rock the flock, whatever you want to call it, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with the Word of God. It's just a constant feast of the flesh, the worldliness, the carnality, and shall we put it bluntly, the rebellion and disobedience to the Word of God. Because the God of the Word is still holy. He will never become worldly. 
He cannot become carnal or sinful. He will never indulge us. But for some people today, oh, you get saved, you get born again. If you're a salesman, Jesus will help you get more sales. You can cheat and graft all you like and the extra money goes in your pocket because you're a Christian. And you can lie and cheat and steal and you can do all the things that the commercial world and the world world does and God will bless you. My first computer was an Apple Mac. What I bought in the shop was not arri what arrived in the box from an Iranian Christian that I'd met in Western Australia. We all know the West Aussies are a funny mob anyway. <laughs> Sand gropers. But um, when I went and had the opportunity to challenge this man about having ripped me off, he said, well, I'm a Christian now and this is how God blesses me. God has blessed me. You got a computer. I know you're not happy with it, but you got a computer. And I got the money. And that's God's blessing for me. I said, but, but you lied. I said, I, I could go to the police station and I could have you prosecuted because you've, you've basically stolen from me. He said, no, you don't understand. This is God's blessing on me. There's a lot of Christians around that have that mindset that I can do whatever I want with this body, which is the temple of God, with this mind, which is the mind of Christ, with this heart and this spirit which are indwelled and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption and I can do whatever I please with it. Folks, it's time we got back to the very basics of the book and ask ourselves, am I being obedient to God's word? When the preacher preaches the word of God, do I receive it as it is in truth, the word of God? Or do I just sit there and think, listen to that old fat fool. What does he know? Well, I know a little bit. I didn't get saved until I was 23 and I didn't come down the river in a bubble. I lived a wicked, sinful life, much to my shame, but praise God. God forgave me, cleansed me, washed me in the blood, gave me a new heart and a new life, and I'm rejoicing in it. But it grieves me that there is so much disobedience to God's word. If we would have a life, if we would have a church, if we would have a witness, either individually or collectively the body, we need to be a people of the word. We need to be a people of the word. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you have given us your word that we might freely know the message of the gospel, the lost and guilty condition of the human soul, that we are all in the sight of a holy and a righteous God. We are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, the very best we can do is in thy sight as filthy rags. Your word tells us that there is none good, no, not one. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All have sinned. And even knowing Christ, we still possess the capacity to be disobedient. Just as we disobeyed our earthly parents, we disobey our heavenly Father. Now, everything you want us to know and to do is here in the pages of this book. It's there in precept and principle. And as the Spirit of God is our teacher and our guide, to guide and direct us, to teach and instruct us everything we need to know to enjoy a spiritually victorious life and to have a bright and glowing witness for Christ. It's in this book if we would read it, if we would obey it, if we would hide it in our heart, as the psalmist said, that we might not sin against thee. Lord, I pray you'd challenge us tonight in our affection, in our attitude, 
in our appetite for thy word and that you would help us to be obedient to the word as you would speak we would have the simple attitude God has spoken I must obey Lord I pray for anyone here tonight who does not know Jesus Christ as saviour I pray that you would graciously touch their heart as only you can do Show them the, the urgency of the hour, the greatness of their need of Christ. So often we bubble along, the years roll by, and we just put spiritual things, the things of God, the things of Christ, we put them on hold. We leave him standing at the door waiting for our verdict on him, but the verdict on us has already been given. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we need salvation. We need Christ. We need to be forgiven. And I pray if there's even one here tonight without Christ, you would touch that heart. I pray you challenge the hearts of your own people that we might indeed live for Christ and make our lives count for eternity for his glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Pastor. All right. Amen. Thank you, Brother Hustler. You ever, have you ever heard someone build something up and you're waiting for the punchline, you're waiting for the product, the, the thing they're talking about, and it comes and it's kind of like, oh, that wasn't, it's kind of a letdown. Well, here he was talking about what was their secret, what, what was the, the, the thing that made Thessalonica so great. And what a truth it is that God's word is God's word. It's God's word. It's truth. It's trustworthy. And when you receive it that way, it, it's effective. Uh, thank you for that reminder. Thank you for that, uh, that message. Let's, um, let's sing song number 24 as our closing. It talks about the name of God, the name of Jesus, how wonderful it is. Brother Hustler mentioned in the message that, uh, that uh, in the Bible we read that, uh, that the word of God, the Bible, is actually magnified above his name. So think of that as we, uh, as we sing this song. But we, we do serve a great God, and, uh, and his word is great. Let's receive it and, and let it speak to us, and let's share it with other people. Let's sing song number 24 in closing. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is a mighty king. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you again, Brother Hustler. Pastor Shalabar, if you would uh, come, please, and close in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Hall. Thank you, uh, Evangelist Hustler. So glad you're here today, tonight to hear a wonderful message from God's Word. Ben Delight, uh, pleased to come back again uh, Saturday night. We'll be here. And um, men, if you would like to come Saturday morning at 8 o'clock for a men's breakfast, please do that. And Sunday morning, of course, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. So uh, 
Thank you all. And uh, let's praise God and close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do praise you. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the wonderful truths of your word. And Lord, as we consider these things, uh, Lord, we pray that as we go now to our homes and to our places, that you would go with us, taking care of us and reminding us of the wonderful truths of your word. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.